Welcome once again to another edition of Good Books. I'm your host this week, Dr. John Cook. And with me today is Linda Tirado, who uh, has a book called Hand to Mouth that really moved me. It's interesting they have a foreword by our Barbara Ehrenreich, who was the author of Nickel and Dimed. We've interviewed Barbara on this show for that book, Nickel and Dimed. Um, and Linda is... Uh, Completely average American with two kids and, until recently, two jobs. Her essay, Why I Make Terrible Decisions on Poverty Thoughts, was picked up by the Huffington Post, The Nation, and countless other publications, and it was read by more than six million people. And when that went viral, she got the opportunity to write this book on the working poor. It's called Hand to Mouth, Living in Bootstrap America. Linda, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Listen, this is tremendous, and as I said, we did the nickel and dimed book, which uh, really was a shocker. I just want to start uh, with an overall view of where you're coming from, because um, I remember during the last presidential election seeing a site with Mitt Romney with his billionaires at uh, Papa John's house, and um, and uh, he, he seems so out of touch, not aware of what the working poor were really going through. And you have a book about what a third of Americans are living right now, which is the working poor, working for minimum wage, or, or sometimes less when they're working for tips. Uh, in general, what would you have to say about that? I think it's inescapable. I think that when we have stratification at, at historic levels, it's kind of unreasonable to expect somebody who's a multimillionaire, who's used to all of his whims, just sort of, you know, his life is comfortable, right? He never has to worry about anything, anything systemic, anything existential. Those things don't bother the super rich. How would they know what it's like to not be sure that your car is going to run tomorrow? They've never had to worry about it. Mitt Romney, he, he's well-meaning. Like, I'm from Utah, so we actually are fairly familiar with the Romney. Mm -hmm. um, and, and everything I've ever seen out of the man tells me that he is a kind man. He sure. is a well-meaning man. But he's the kind of guy who lived off of his stock dividends in college and thought that that was slumming it, mm -hmm. right? And, and he, that was his period of poverty that he remembered was when all he had to live on were his stock dividends. And I thought to myself, oh, honey, you really don't get it, do you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, and I appreciate your, your just mentioning that he, he intends to be compassionate. He just has no clue. I think one of the things you say in the introduction that, that's poignant is that, that we look at the academic problems of poverty and we, we have no idea why, or, but it's rare to have a poor person actually explain it on their own behalf. I love the phrase, rest is a luxury for the rich. I get up at 6 a.m., go to school, have a full course load. Um, then to go to work, then I get the kids and I pick up my husband, I have half an hour to change to go to job two, I get home from around around 12.30 a.m., then I have the rest of my classes to tend to, I'm in bed by three, that's isn't every day, I have two days off from each of my obligations, but still, you know, the the driving, the commuting, and that's something Barbara Ehrenreich talked about, especially if you're working for minimum wage, the probability is that your housing isn't where your job is, so you have an, an, a, a right. di distant commute as well, right? Right. And and so what we really get wound up in, and this is, I think, a, a thing that rich folks don't understand, the logistics of our lives take up most of our time. Mm -hmm. We are doing logistics constantly. You're at your first shift at a restaurant. Say you have two jobs, right? It, assume both of them are in restaurants. So you have an electric bill coming up. You know you've got to get that paid this afternoon. You are going to spend your entire morning while you are at work thinking, okay, how busy is it going to be today? How much am I going to make? Am I going to make, make enough to pay that bill? And if I don't make enough to get that bill paid, how am I going to call them and let them know that it's going to be a couple of days? And how likely is it that the electric company is going to be really nice to me this month? And once I've done that, do I need to stay late and get more money at this job? And if I do that, is it going to make me late to my next job? Or are they going to cut me early today, in which case I need to call my boss at my second job and ask for extra hours so I can pay my electric bill? Mm -hmm. That is what paying your electric bill is like, mm -hmm. right? And that's just one tiny thing that most people do without ever thinking about it. And so when you're looking at all of, this, all of these logistics and all of these potential pitfalls, when you really are living day to day and paycheck to paycheck, 
the idea that people have that we're, we're bad citizens, we're lazy, we are the most hardworking people in America. And I am an author now. I have written a book. I can say that with authority. <laughs> I would rather write a book than scrub a fryer. Mm-hmm. Understood. Well, you know, this, this is going to be particularly interesting to people of the Rio Grande Valley or our listeners here because uh, we have the lowest median income in the country. And so there's an awful lot of people working at the level that you're working at. But I did want to go through your definitions, uh, poverty, broke, (laughs) middle class, and rich, because I really like your definitions. Uh, So poor is when a dollar is a miracle. Broke is when five bucks is a miracle. Working class is being broke but doing so in a place that might not be run down. Middle class is being able to own some toys and live in a nice place. And by nice, I don't mean fancy. I mean you can afford to buy your own furniture and not lease it while you still worry about the bills. And you aren't constantly worried about homeless. And rich is anything above that. So when you say rich folks, you're talking about all those folks who don't have to worry about leasing their furniture, right? Yeah. When I'm talking about rich folks, I'm talking about folks who have faith that their car will still be running in a month. They, mm-hmm. they just never think about it. That is rich to me. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, and, and for the vast majority of people, you're talking a third of America that's working at minimum wage or just barely above. And the thing about minimum wage that we never look at is that seven twenty five an hour, okay, great. How many people are working for seven thirty five or for seven fifty or for seven sixty five? Because we get minimum. our raises in nickels. Uh-huh. We get our raises in ten cents. We get our we get raises once a year for maybe a quarter. So when you're talking about minimum wage, I lump all those folks in together. Honey, you're working at a Burger King. I don't care if you're making seven twenty five or seven fifty, you're still making minimum wage as far as I'm concerned. Right. When absolutely. we're talking about the issues. Yeah, clearly. And and you talk too about the federal minimum for waiting tables being two thirteen an hour and you're supposed to make that up in tips. And if you don't make the minimum wage, you're supposed to go to your boss and say, Hi, I didn't make minimum but of course that risks your job, doesn't it? We'll put it this way. I, I know that a lot of corporate restaurants are very scrupulous about doing that because, you know, there's laws involved. I have yet to work at a mom-and-pop restaurant where I could work, look my boss in the face and say, Honey, it was really slow today. You think you could kick me 40 bucks and make it right? Mm-hmm. You don't do that. Right. You don't do that. You don't take that risk. Um, the, the It Takes Money to Make Money chapter talks about uh, some of the work you did when you were working in a bar and a restaurant and – um, mentions the the other issues you have to deal with in addition to not making enough money to survive, and it's things like sexual harassment from one of your bosses. Um, and that just seems to be a part of the norm as well. You said any – I'm going to try and keep this as clean as I can, although I, I love the way you've written this. Uh, <laughs> you say any a-hole with money can buy a business, whether they know anything about it or not, right? Um, but this guy, yeah, yeah it, it takes a smart person to have an investment in human capital, but any jerk can buy a company. Mm-hmm. So one of your bosses at the bar liked to remark uh, on how young you were and accidentally brushing against parts of your body and uh, even with his wife in earshot would hit on you and that seemed to all be okay with his wife. Is that – His poor wife. Well, that's that's actually an amalgamation of a couple of bosses. Right, yeah. Um, but there, there was one in particular who would um, – he'd come into the bar every day with his wife and he'd just sit there and be like, so you're going to come back and hang out in my office with me? i got to do some paperwork. You know, that office is looking pretty good. And I just look at him and say, no, I'm, I'm good. And his wife would laugh because she thought he was kidding. He kept saying it, it was in a funny tone. He was just, you know, making fun of men who would sexually harass their employees. He wasn't actually doing it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, dang if every single woman that went into the office with him didn't get the good shift. Mm-hmm. I mean, and everybody's seen that happen, right? And and that's kind of another trap that we run into is is we're talking about power and coercion, right? You can't call your boss out if you need the job. If you're a particular kind of woman, you can look him in the face and say, honey, it ain't going to happen, and he'll believe you. Mm-hmm. But there's an awful lot of women that don't, you know, have whatever – you know, it takes to get men to back off. And it's really common, especially in the bar and restaurant industry. The amount of sexual harassment I have taken in the bar and restaurant industry, because they're rough and tumble places, right? And that's just how it rolls. And it's that way across all of America from what I've seen. But And, and there are good bosses and bad bosses in every industry. But in the service industry, if you're a woman, you can expect to be sexually harassed by either a customer, a coworker, or your boss at least once a day. Mm-hmm. There was a there, the a finish to this first chapter uh, really uh, touched something inside me about um, 
temp workers and the use of temp workers so as not to have to pay benefits. And there was a plant you lived near that used to hire temp workers, and then they'd lay them off after 90 days because then they would get permanent job status, and after three weeks of unemployment, they'd hire them back. And and at some point, uh, it didn't exist anymore because after the tax break expired, the company decided the plant wasn't profitable enough, and they closed it. And uh, the last line in the chapter is, who says capitalism isn't cruel? I think that's something that people don't look at who are old pro-capitalist in their rhetoric sometimes. You know, the interesting thing is I'm not actually anti-capitalist. Right. What I am against is saying, you know, okay, well, there's winners and losers in this system, so screw you, losers. Mm -hmm. What we should be saying is there are winners and losers in this system, and in exchange for winning, we will take care of the losers, because without them, we could not win. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I have been rocketed out of my station. I'm, I went from being a night cook at IHOP to a published author doing a radio tour in under a year. <laughs> you know what I am grateful for? Every service worker in America who has made this possible for me, because this is not a thing that I did alone. This came after years of talking with everybody that I've worked with, after years of hearing people talk about what their lives were. All of those things came together. I could not have written this book without all of those people. And the fact that I keep that in mind is what capitalism is supposed to be, that you look down below you if you are in a position of power and you look down and you say, how do I help you guys climb up instead of saying, let me pull this ladder up behind me. Yeah, that, that, there is enough to go around. Mm-hmm. So compassionate capitalism might be a phrase that you would use then. Well, I don't necessarily know that I could personally use that, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let's talk about some of the, the working conditions because you mentioned, you mentioned a, a, a major restaurant chain, and, uh, and at times you were – working uh, where you had to run into the freezer a few minutes to cool down because the the fryers are really hot and your arms and hands are covered in scars from the fryers. And that seems to be typical of the working conditions that people face when they're working in a, a fast food kitchen. Oh, fast food, slow food, doesn't matter. Any kitchen is dangerous and mm-hmm. hot. That's that's just, you're, you're surrounding yourself with fire. So yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be cold. But when the air conditioner goes out, I'm in the middle of the summer in the desert and you're in a kitchen. Yeah, it reaches intolerable conditions. But that's even beyond the restaurant industry. We had what Amazon was, and it had had warehouses where they actually had to keep ambulances outside for the heat stroke. Mm. I mean, and and, and they, they just did. They started calling the ambulances and just having them stationed outside instead of just making it so people didn't get heat stroke so frequently. But what we get when we get injuries, the trouble we run into is there's nothing we can do about them. If you go to workers' comp, and and that is a system that's supposed to be set up to protect us, right? If you get hurt at work, your your employer's supposed to pay for it. Mm -hmm. I don't know many service workers that are going to go call workers' comp, because what happens after that is you start getting written up for every minor infraction, and then you lose your job with quickness. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, nothing provable, but... eh. Yeah. It's, it's a pattern. Yeah, workers' comp is one issue. Another is, and, and I did not know this until I read your book, that you have no legal right to take breaks in America. And, that is a true statement. Uh, that, uh, there's no law that says that employers should require breaks. And, and you mentioned potential bladder infections, and that, that's one of the issues that, that is a stream throughout this. Is like, you know, there are certain people that are allowed to go to the bathroom and certain people who are not on their jobs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, And not only that, certain people are allowed to make the decision of whether or not they need to go to the bathroom and their work can wait for five minutes, and people who actually need to ask permission and justify their own, you know, waste systems to their boss. Mm-hmm. Let's talk a little the bit. number of times I've had to go to my boss and say, listen, I have some gastrointestinal issues, I really need to go to the bathroom, they go, you can't, and I go, I have to actually describe what is happening in my guts so that I can go to the bathroom to save myself from embarrassing myself in front of everybody. The fact that that is a thing that I have to do for $7.25 an hour? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, You talk about how easy it is to get fired and that people don't understand that. I mean, that's that's why people find themselves hand-to-mouth sometimes is they had a job and they were living with almost enough money to make it and then they get fired for some ridiculous reason, whether it's working more than one job or because one week you're working 10 hours instead of 20 and uh, you work 30 when it's busy and 10 when it's slow and they let you go when it's slow and 
all of that figures into how often someone can not keep a job even though they're trying to work, right? Yeah. I got fired once because my car broke down and I couldn't make it to work. I've been fired, I mean, and I've been fired not as frequently as I've quit or, or moved to a different job, but it's happened more than once. And what I've found is that the reasons are always really interesting. Like, I got fired once so that my boss could hire his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, there's X amount of spaces on staff, and he needed her to pay rent. And so he looked at which one of us did he want to go. Well, it was me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't get along with him, so it was a really good excuse. Mm-hmm. I mean, things like that happen. I know somebody who got fired because they had to go to the hospital for three days, and they missed two shifts. And when they came back, they have no job. Well, let's talk about um, your access to medical and dental care, because that's really a, a, an, an interesting story on your part in particular. Uh, you had an accident that caused damage to your teeth, and you've mm-hmm. reached a point where you couldn't even smile anymore. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Well, it's horrifyingly embarrassing, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's incredibly painful, and it does a number on your self-esteem. And it shouldn't happen because dental care is not considered a medical thing in America. And this goes all the way back to when dentists were barbers Mm -hmm. and they were different than doctors, right? And we have not changed our policies since the 1800s. So dentistry and medical care are considered to be a different thing. Now, the fact that my jaw decayed to the point that I have um, inner ear problems, that I have headaches, that it's like a legitimate problem with infection, those things don't make it count as medical, regardless of the impact it has on the rest of your body. So what we wound up with is we've got this whole class of people that have no access to dental care because dental care generally isn't covered by Medicaid. It's generally not covered in these safety net programs, neither is vision, and in a lot of cases, neither is mental health. So we've got this patchwork in the safety net, but I think people think that it covers more than it does. It covers basic doctor's cares, it covers basic hospital visits, ER visits, maybe it covers prescriptions, but you're not getting glasses and a new set of dentures. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, you had some less than adequate care on, on those teeth, and, uh, and in that encounter, there was some embarrassment because of the way you looked. They accused you of being a meth addict, which you weren't. Uh, oh, I finally walked into a dentist after a few years. I saved up enough, um, and, and we had a kind of a good spot, and I had enough money to go. So I went to a dentist, and the first thing she said was, well, you really need to quit doing math. And I looked at her, and I said, I don't do math. And she said, honey, look at your teeth. Of course you do. And then she lectured me for the entire time she was doing this exam. 45 minutes, I'm in this chair. She's telling me about the dangers of drug use and how, you know, meth is going to destroy your life. And I'm looking at her going, listen, I smoked a little weed when I was in college, man, but I do not use meth. I lack the giant sores. I don't look older than I am. I have none of the side effects. I just have really bad teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, and but but that didn't seem to matter because once she came to that judgment, she decided that I must be lying to her because she could see clearly on the one piece of evidence that she had, and she made her case in her head, and that's how it was. It was the single most humiliating experience of my life, and I include working in an industry in which men would touch my butt with their hands while I'm trying to work and ask me to come home with them in not so polite ways. Mm-hmm. I would still rather have that happen for that 45 minutes than I would be in that chair with that dentist because she made me feel like an absolutely worthless human being. And the worst part is she knew she was doing it and she enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And that is what being poor is, is always being ready for somebody to enjoy humiliating you. Yeah. I hope this message gets across to a lot of people. In fact, I hope this book goes as viral as your message because it really is powerful in that regard. And there are several places where you're – empathy from from your own understanding makes you understand that people feel less than human. One of the places you talk about that is is you're just tired all the time. You know, you talk about how you love to read, but there's just not enough energy to do that uh, because the energy is drained from You know, they've done these... Yeah, no, they've done studies, actually. If you pretend to be happy and joyful and welcoming all day long, it actually blunts your ability to feel those emotions for real. Like, that is an actual thing that they can measure now. So all of these service workers who are so chipper and happy to see you understand that the cost of that is that they don't actually feel real happiness. 
mm-hmm. not in the same extent as, as a normal human emotion with, with regular broad uh, emotional capacity. Our mental capacity is halved. They've proven at this point that, that being poor or being in poverty is about the same amount of points off your IQ just because you're so busy dealing with all of the stress and all of the stuff that comes up. It's like missing two nights of sleep in a row. So anybody that wants to know what it's like to be poor and why maybe sometimes our logic doesn't quite match up to what the you know correct situation or the correct logic would be if you could step outside, go two nights without sleep and then try to get, with, get through your day. Mm-hmm. And that feeling that you have that you're never quite on top of everything, that's what it's like every day of our lives. Mm-hmm. And, and while we're on the subject of, of uh, not being respected and appreciated, I'd like to touch on the fact that you talk about I'm a smoker. And you talk about people uh, are less moralistic about the vices they have themselves than they are about whatever vices poor people tend to have. Look, rich people, and, and, and this is a line from the book, they drink nicer wine out of better glasses. But it does not matter what the year on your wine bottle is or whether it's a bottle of rock gut. You're still drinking with your friends. You can go to the doctor. If you've got doctor access and medical care, you can go there. You can get a prescription for antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicine, and that's all well and good. I pick up a pack of camels because I don't have the access to that doctor and those medicines, and suddenly it's like I'm killing children. Mm-hmm. We self-medicate with what we have access to. And the fact that there's prescription drug abuse rates among the wealthy that rival street drug rate use among the poor should tell you that it's a human behavior. We all do it. It's just that wealthy people can do it in a classier way, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, in fact, we had an interview on this program with a guy who wrote a book called Saving Normal about over diagnosis of mental illness, suggesting that prescription drug abuse has surpassed street drug abuse. Uh, So there's even more of that going on than there was in the past. Um, well, and our abuse is more visible, right? Because sure. we don't have Betty Ford or swanky rehab centers. Mm-hmm. We, we just deal with it mm-hmm. until we can find a spot in a program. Mm-hmm. But a rich kid, you know, goes to, goes to college and develops a habit. His parents send him to rehab two or three times, and everything's fine. If you have the money to cover your mistakes, it looks like you didn't make any. And that's where people start judging the poor, because our mistakes are visible. Mm-hmm. Let's and the repercussions are so much worse. Claire. So let's, let's touch on uh, the balanced diet a little bit then, because it's a whole lot easier to eat junk food when you're poor, right? Yeah, and not only that, it makes more sense. Mm-hmm. So assume that I have half an hour in between my shifts. I can either go to a real restaurant and be late for work and pay about double the amount, or I can pick up a quarter pounder or a double cheeseburger for a dollar. The other thing you have to think about is how much energy we expend because our work is mostly physical. So I could eat a salad. I'm going to be starving again in two hours. Get me a giant wad of processed meat. I'm probably going to be fine for my whole shift. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about calories in, calories out, and and, and how to choose your food, we are going for both fast and filling and staying power. The food of the poor has always been more basic than the food of the wealthy because the food of the poor has to be quick and easy and filling. Mm Mm-hmm. And McDonald's and Wendy's and, you know, all of these places that we get hit for, for patronizing have done very well at making chip, cheap, quick, and filling. Not only that, those chemicals and the stuff that they put in and, and just the base nature of the food itself actually does stuff to your brain, right? It lights up the pleasure centers of your brain, and that's a thing we don't get very frequently. We don't go for vacations and get two weeks off. We get a cheeseburger. Uh-huh. That's what we have. That's a powerful statement. Well, well, I do, I do want to touch on the S word a little bit because one of my pet peeves is how much slut shaming goes on in America. So let's talk about sex just a little bit. Um, we have it. It's free. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Okay. I'm in favor. <laughs> okay. And wealthy people don't seem to understand that when a poor person pairs up with somebody who maybe isn't perfect or, or doesn't have the greatest looks or teeth or attitude about the world. Uh, they're all looking for Julia Roberts to find her Richard Gere, I guess, as you say in the book. Yes, and there's only so many of those to go around. You know, the other interesting thing to me is that wealthy people, and and this is something I'm kind of seeing just from, from, you know, the last few months of my life where I'm dealing with these new social circles, 
they marry for prestige in a lot of cases. Like, people won't go out with folks that don't have a car, don't have a degree, or don't have this or that. In, on my level, I'm looking for somebody who makes me feel happy, who makes me feel beautiful, who makes me feel valued. And it does not matter whether he has a job, and it does not matter whether he's the hottest thing to come along, and it does not matter how nice his car is. Does he make me feel lovely? That's good enough for me. Mm-hmm. That's all I need. That's all I'm looking for is some companionship, a partner. It doesn't have to be perfect. Nothing that I have is perfect nothing. Why would I look for that in a relationship? You don't. You don't expect perfection. You're not entitled to that sort of thing. Beyond which, you're not perfect yourself. Why on earth would you try to class yourself out like that? Yeah. You know, I had a... Anybody that's going to have a Burger King worker is probably going to work at Burger King. (laughs) (laughs) I I had a girlfriend's mother tell her that it's just as easy to love a rich man as it is a poor man. That was sort of the programming that went on there. Uh, uh, let's let's harder to find a rich man though. <laughs> it is that's true. <laughs> well, let's 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 do the welfare baby thing because this one really hit home for me. I, I hear so much disparaging comments about um, um, the poor being welfare baby factories, and they're in it to make more babies. And and you really uh, stood up to that re- really well in that chapter on babies. Well, I mean, look. Th- when you have extra babies and you you if you're if you're in the system you're getting say food stamps and you know medical care the amount of value that you're going to get for having another baby is maybe a few thousand dollars a year and that's all going to go to the care and feeding of that child it's not like you get extra cash money so why on earth you would go through a pregnancy and bring another child into this world and have to deal with colic and and changing diapers and potential boyfriends or girlfriends in a few years and college and all of that so that you can, what, get free medical care for a kid from the government? Like, the logic doesn't even work there. There is no incentive for us to have extra children unless you assume that we're so damn stupid we'll take on child rearing for an extra couple hundred bucks a year. Now, there are people that are that stupid. Are they the majority of people? Absolutely not. It's the silliest friggin' thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. I am not going to have another baby so that I can get that baby some medical care. Mm -hmm. That is stupid. And beyond that, how much money do I need to have in the bank before I'm allowed to procreate? How much money do I need to have in the bank before I'm capable of being a loving, skilled parent? How much money do I need to have in the bank before it's okay for me to have a child. And at what point does that work into eugenics? I mean, that is a slippery, slippery slope to say, well, you don't have enough money. Well, honey, it costs what they figure about 230 grand or something to take a child, you know, all the way from, from birth to through college if you're doing it the upper middle class way. Should we all have to have that amount of money in the bank before we're allowed? Mm-hmm. And if so, who's going to be the police of that? And not only that, I don't really like the way the rich people raise their kids. They're raising a whole generation of kids that have this giant sense of entitlement. I don't like that. I don't like what it does for the future of America. So where do I sign up to start judging other people's child-rearing habits? Mm -hmm. I really liked your piece about being at a park and uh, your kid skinning her knee and and, uh, somebody offering you an antibiotic for that. And you said, no, thanks. You'll get well without it. I liked that a lot. (laughs) She skinned her knee, man. It wasn't like she was, you know, had exposed bones or anything. Right. Well, this, she's a kid. Let her skin her knee. Yeah. Th- this is beautiful. Uh, we've been interviewing uh, Linda Tirado. Her very interesting book is Hand to Mouth, Living in Bootstrap America. I want to remind our listeners that if you don't hear us on Thursday or Sunday, you can check us out on our, our uh, YouTube site by uh, searching for Good Books Radio, Strong and Cook. I'm your host, Dr. John Cook. Thanks for listening. 